I'm not preaching the normal message today, so open your Bibles to Genesis 34. I'm preaching what the Lord gave me, so here we go. Genesis 34, and I want us to read as far as I can because I'm going to begin a message today which I have entitled Family Sins. I will actually finish the message next Sunday, but I think the subject is vitally important. So look in Genesis 34, if you would, and begin there with verse 1. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hammer, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father Hammer, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. And Hammer, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved. And they were very wroth because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. And Hammer communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her to him to wife. And make you marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. And you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell, and trade you therein, and get you possessions therein. And Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes, and what you shall say unto me I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as you shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. And Jacob and the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamer his father deceitfully and said, Because he had defiled Dinah their sister. And they said unto them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. But in this will we consent unto you. If you will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised, then will we give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters unto us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter, and we will be gone. And their words pleased Hammer and Shechem, and Shechem Hammer's son. And the young man deferred not to do the thing, because he had delight in Jacob's daughter, and he was more honorable than all the house of his father. And Hamer and Shechem, his son, came into the gate of their city and communed with the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceable with us, therefore let them dwell in the land and trade therein. For the land, behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only herein will the men consent unto us for to dwell with us, to be one people, if every male among us be circumcised, as they are circumcised, shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them, and they will dwell with us. And unto Ammer, and unto Shechem his son hearkened to all that went out of the gate of the city, and every male was circumcised, all that went out of the gate of his city. It came to pass on the third day, when they were sore, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. And they slew Hammer and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword, took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep and their oxen, their asses, and that which was in the city, and that which was in the field, and all their wealth, and all their little ones, and their wives, and they took captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me to make me distinct among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and Perizzites. And I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. And they said... Should he deal with our sister as with a harlot? I can imagine the surprise in each one's mind as I announce the title of this message, Family Sins. Uh, the title sounds almost like a TV drama or soap opera series. Unhappily, we do not need to turn to Hollywood for direction in this message. We've been in, we have been given ample material in the Bible and if we were to examine our personal lives and our family lives, I'm sure that we could find an additional wealth of material on the subject. 
Now you have been taught and you have understood, I hope, biblically and correctly so, that each man, each individual is responsible for his own sin. Let me just tell you, the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel 18 and verse 20, listen to what God says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Notice he said, every man shall die for his own sin. Father shall not die for the son, son shall not die for the father. Each one is responsible and accountable. When you get to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24 and verse 16, God says it like this, The father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Each of us understand, or at least we should understand, that we are answerable and accountable for our own sins. Our sins are our own. Own. And we must face the consequences for our attitudes and our actions. However, there is another principle in Scripture. I want you to hold Genesis 34, but I want you to look in your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 14 and verse 7. Romans 14 and verse 7. Watch carefully. Romans 14 and verse 7. The Bible just simply says this, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Now it is true that we're each responsible for our own sins. But here is another verse that says, No man liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. Do you realize there are such things as learned behavior patterns. There are such things as learned sins. In fact, many children learn their sins from their parents. Greediness, selfishness, anger, rebellion, lustfulness, even idolatry can be learned. Let me just very quickly give you some verses that demonstrate this. In 2 Chronicles 30 and verse 8, you don't have to turn there. Let me just quote it. 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 8. God says, Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord, and enter into his sanctuary, which he hath sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. Now listen to what he said. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were. In other words, don't imitate them. Don't emulate them. Don't take their sins for your sins. And then in Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 4, he said it like this. Be not as your fathers unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn you now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear or hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Now what did God say to these children? Don't be like your fathers. Don't copy their sins. Don't follow them in their wickedness and their rebellion. But God said they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't hearken. Stephen, the first martyr, in Acts chapter 7, in verse 51, when he was speaking to the people, he said this, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. I hope you understand that what Stephen is saying, what Zechariah is saying, that here are these children that have learned their sins from their parents. So sins then are not only oftentimes based upon our own lusts, but they are oftentimes learned behavior patterns. It should be an eye-opening concept to most parents to understand that in all probabilities, 
in all probability, your children will turn out to be a carbon copy of you. Stop and think about that. They will embrace our attitudes. They will embrace our actions. They will follow our conduct. And sometimes they will go beyond us in our sin and in our rebellion. For instance, in the book of Judges, chapter 2 and verse 19, the Bible says this concerning the children of Israel. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down to them. They ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. But notice what he said. They corrupted themselves more than their fathers. In other words, their rebellion, their wickedness exceeded that which they learned from their parents. Now, let me say something else in light of this. It is not always the case, but usually so and generally so, that if the children are taught biblically and are given a godly example, they will turn out to be responsible, godly children. Now, I said generally so and usually so because I don't want to presume upon the grace of God. It is true, based upon the Scripture, that God normally, usually, sets His elect in families. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 22 and verse 6, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. However, I'm sure you have known and I have known, there have been absolute corrupt and wicked families that all of a sudden, here is a godly individual. Read the Bible. You will find many times a wicked, ungodly father produced a godly son, especially in the kingship line. Read about Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king. He was a godly king. His father was a wicked king. His son turned out wicked. His wicked son's son turned out godly. But the point I'm trying to make, as a general rule, God normally places his elect in families. And as a general rule, if we train up the children in the way that they should go, when we live a godly example in front of them and teach them godly ways, generally they turn out to be godly individuals. Now I just read to you Genesis chapter 34. The question we have to ask is, what happened in Dinah's case? I mean, Jacob is known as the father of Israel. In fact, his name was changed to Israel. He produced the 12 sons, the 12 tribes. So what happened in Dinah's case? The answer is what usually happens today. We could also answer that with this. What has happened in times past and continues to happen down through the ages. What we have forgotten is this. Our sin or our sins always affect others. Not only do our sins affect others, but sin will beget sin. Now, before you begin to argue that what happened to Dinah was not Dinah's fault, you need to consider all the facts. So what I want to do today is I want you to consider with me, first of all, the sin of Jacob, secondly, the sin of Dinah, and then next week we're going to look at some more family sins. But let's consider the sin of Jacob first. If you will look in your Bibles, in Genesis chapter 28, turn there if you would, and let me ask a question. We know that Jacob is in Shechem. So here's my question. What in the world was Jacob doing in Shechem? Now, he had been sent by his father and his mother to Padan Aram, which is Syria, to get a wife for himself. 
And if you look in Genesis 28 in verse 5, And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padan Aram unto Laban, son of Bethuel the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau's mother. And of course, he went there to get a wife. Now, you remember how he served Laban 14 years for Rachel and for Leah, and then he served another period of time for all the sheep that he got. So if you look in Genesis chapter 33 now, notice verse 17, Jacob is on his way back. The Bible says, and Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of that place is called Succoth. But now he did not stay in Succoth. Skip down to verse 18. And Jacob came, came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hammer, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And he erected there an altar and he called it El Elohi Israel. So the question that I have to ask again is this. What in the world was Jacob doing in Shechem? Let me ask it another way. Was there anything wrong with living in Shechem? Undoubtedly, there was and could not be anything wrong with living in Shechem if that was where the Lord wanted Jacob to live. Why in the world did Jacob stop in Shechem and buy a parcel of land? Now, Let me show you. Look in your Bibles to Genesis 31 at verses 2 and 3. Genesis 31, beginning there with verse 2. Now, Laban's countenance has changed against Jacob because he sees that God is giving him all of his cattle. And the Bible says this. Jacob is speaking now. Genesis 31, verse 2. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto thy land of thy fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. And Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field and to his flock. And he said unto them, I see your father's countenance that is not toward me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. And then, of course, here Jacob says, He's called on me to leave. But I want you to note what God told him in verse 3, he tells Jacob to return to the land of his father and to his kindred. His kindred did not live in Shechem. If you look in Genesis 32 and verse 9, Jacob understood this. Genesis 32 and verse 9, And Jacob said... O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. So twice now it has been told to Jacob, and Jacob understood it, that he was to return to his country and he was returned to his kindred. Now, you know the story how Jacob is coming back into the land And Esau hears about it. And Esau is coming to meet Jacob with 400 men. And Jacob is afraid. And you remember how he divides his family into companies and how he sends presents to Esau to try to pacify him. Well, of course, Esau comes and he and Jacob hugs and... and, uh, Jacob encourages him to keep the gifts and keep the presents that he sent. He says, I have plenty. And Esau now is asking Jacob to come with him to Mount Seir. So I want you to notice, if you would please, in Genesis 33 and verse 14, here is what Jacob tells Esau. Look at it. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me, and the children be able to endure until I come unto my Lord, unto Mount Seir. Now wait a minute. God had told him return to Canaan and to his kindred. 
If you look in Genesis chapter 36, Genesis 36, verses 8 and 9. Watch this. Genesis 36, verse 8. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. These are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. These are the names of Esau's son. Note if you would, Esau lived in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. Edom was not Jacob's country. Esau may have been his kin, but it was not his country. Ah, oh. now what did God tell Jacob to do? He told him to go to his country and to his kindred. Where did his kindred live? His father was still alive, and his father lived in Hebron. Look in your Bibles to Genesis 35. Notice, if you would, beginning there with verse 27. This is later now. This is after Shechem, okay? This is after his time in Shechem in Genesis 34. So here you have Genesis 35, verse 27. And Jacob came unto Isaac his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were a hundred and fourscore years. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Now let me ask you a question. I want you to think about this. Why in the world did Jacob stop in Shechem when his elderly father was in Hebron and evidently dying. And remember, he hadn't seen him now in about 20 years. Why in the world would he stop in Shechem? <sighs> Do you remember when Jacob left his parents to go to Padan, Padan Aram to seek a wife. There was a place there on his way after he left Isaac and Rebekah. There was a place that he went to sleep. And God revealed himself to Jacob. Look back in your Bibles to Genesis 28. Here Jacob is now. He is leaving his family. He's leaving his country. And he's going into Padan Aram. And notice, if you would, in Genesis 28, beginning there with verse 16, Jacob is sleeping not far from where his parents lived. Notice, and Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Jacob arose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house and all that thou shalt give me I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Now notice God has particularly and peculiarly revealed himself to Jacob at Bethel. Jacob says, this is the house of God. What did God tell Jacob? He said, arise and go back to your country and to your kindred. Now, note if you would, the incident with Dinah happens in Genesis 34. The incident with Simeon and Levi happened in Genesis 34. Now look in Genesis chapter 35 and verse 1. We're going to come back to Genesis 34, but look at verse 1 of Genesis 35. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel. That's where God appeared to him in the beginning. Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Now wait a minute. Jacob is in Shechem. After the incident with Dinah, after the incident with Simeon, and Levi, now God says, go back to Bethel. That's where I reveal myself to you. That's the house of God. Do you realize? 
had Jacob obeyed God to begin with and returned to his country and to his kindred, Hebron was only 30 miles from Bethel. So my question is, what in the world was Jacob doing in Shechem? Why did he not go to his country and to his kindred? Had he gone there initially... The incident in Genesis 34 would never have happened. But I want to show you something. Go back to Genesis 33 and look at verse 19. Remember now, God had told Jacob to go back to his country and to his kingdom, and to his kindred. Watch, if you would, please, in verse 19. He gets to Shechem and he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hammer, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. Let me ask you a question. Since God had told Jacob to go back to his country and to his kingdom, he wanted him back around Hebron and Bethel. Why did Jacob buy a parcel of ground in Shechem? Why do you buy land when you're traveling? We just came back from Indiana. I didn't stop on the way up or on the way by, back and buy a parcel of ground. I haven't lost anything in Indiana or any of the other states I passed through. The point I'm trying to make is this. Did he do like Lot? You remember, Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the well-watered plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. Did Jacob just lift up his eyes and say, Man, look at the pasture here. I've got cattle. I've got sheep. This is a wonderful place to raise cattle and sheep. Sodom and Gomorrah was a wonderful place to raise cattle and sheep too. Wasn't fit for children. Wasn't fit for families. It was a wonderful place for cows. Is that what Jacob did? Or maybe Jacob said, I'm just tired. I've wrestled with God. I faced my brother Esau. I'm just going to give in and give up and give out and rest a while. I don't know. But he bought a piece of land and God had told him, return to your country and to your kindred. Now Shechem... That land was true in the country, but it wasn't anywhere near his kingdom, his kindred. Now I want you to watch something else he did. Look in Genesis 33 and verse 20. When he got to Shechem, the Bible says he erected there an altar and called it El Elohi Israel. Now let me tell you something about building an altar unto God. I don't care if you Follow it through Abraham or Isaac or anyone else. Do you know where altars were built? Altars were only built to God where God had peculiarly and particularly manifested himself. God had never manifested himself to Jacob in Shechem. He had manifested himself in Bethel. That's when he anointed that pillar with oil. And he said, this is none other than the house of God. So if God did not manifest himself to Jacob and Shechem, why did Jacob build an altar there? Well, Jacob just simply took it upon himself to erect an altar. Let me tell you something, folks. An altar is meaningless if you're out of the will of God. What good is it to try to worship God if you're in rebellion to God? You know, our Lord said it like this. 
He said, if you come to the altar to worship God, and there remember that your brother hath ought against you, what's he say? Leave your gift at the altar. Go and be reconciled to thy brother, and then come back and alter, offer your gift. What good would it do to offer a gift when you're harboring hatred and malice and ill will and unforgiving attitudes in your heart? It's not. It's worthless. You know what Jacob was doing, I believe? Jacob was doing what so many people do. They were erecting a front. They were erecting a facade. They were pretending, Jacob was pretending like others, that he was really right with God and really wanted to do which was, that which was right. And at the same time, he was living in rebellion to God's plain command. God had told him, return to your country and your kindred. And Jacob had refused to do that. Now let me show you something. Had Jacob obeyed God... Dinah would have never been in Shechem. If Dinah had never been in Shechem, then Shechem, the son of Hamor, would have never defiled her. The point I want you to make, I want to make is this. Our sins affect every member of our family. Our sins affect our church. Our sins affect other people. No man liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. We cannot harbor even secret sins and not expect them to ultimately influence our children. I want you to see that Jacob's sin is connected to Dinah's sin. It is true Dinah is responsible for her sins. Jacob's responsible for his sins. But the sins are connected. They're family sins. And you're going to see that the sin of one affects the lives of others. I want you to look secondly today with me and consider the sin of Dinah. Look in Genesis chapter 34 and verse 1. And Dinah, the daughter of Levi, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Now the word Dinah is the feminine of Dan, which the name actually means judged or avenged. And I want you to note as you look at verse 1 of Genesis 34, how casually and apparently innocently her actions are stated. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Now let me ask a question. What could possibly be wrong for a young girl to go out and visit other girls? What could possibly be wrong with visiting the daughters of the land? Well, first, let me tell you, without me going through all the chronology and the genealogy, Dinah was at this time between the ages of 13 and 15. Arguably, that was a marriageable age back at that particular time. But here is a young girl between 13 and 15, and she goes out to visit the daughters of the land. Secondly, the daughters of the land that she went out to see and visit were Canaanites. The Canaanites in the Bible were some of the most wicked and vile people that ever lived. When you look at Genesis 34 and verse 1, And Dinah the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see 
the daughters of the land. The word see in the Hebrew actually means to see, to perceive, to comprehend, to gaze, and to regard. In other words, there was something about the daughters of the land that attracted Dinah. Basically, she went out to see the manners and the customs and the fashions of the women. And according to the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, the word actually means she went out to learn the fashions of the land. Now, Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that uh, there was a festival going on. And she knew that there'd be plenty of young women there who would give her an opportunity to to see and regard how they lived and how they dressed and how they conducted themselves. There are other commentators who suggest that uh, Shechem had previously seen Dinah and that he himself had put on this festival just to get her away from her parents. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But regardless of how it came about. In all probability, Dinah left home without her parents' permission and certainly without their protection and authority. You and I have heard the expression, curiosity kill the cat. Curiosity may not only kill cats, but curiosity will get us all into trouble. And especially when we're curious about things that God has forbidden. Let me just spell it to you very plainly. When God forbids something, we do not need to be curious about it or interested in it. Period. I have no desire to know how tarot cards work. I have no desire to know how fortune tellers cook up their lives. I I don't want to know. God has forbidden that. When God forbids anything, you and I should never ever be curious about it. God had certainly forbade young women to go out without the parents' permission and protection. Let me read you the comment of John Calvin on this section. He says this. Listen carefully. Dinah is ravished because having left her father's house, she wandered about more freely than was proper. She ought to have remained quietly at home, as both the apostle teaches and nature itself dictates, for to girls the virtue is suitable, which the proverb applies to women that they should be keepers of the house. Therefore, fathers of families are taught to keep their daughters under strict discipline if they desire to preserve them free of all dishonor. For if a vain curiosity was so heavily punished in the daughter of holy Jacob, not less danger hangs over weak virgins at this day if they go too boldly and eagerly into public assemblies and excite the passions of youth toward themselves. For it is not to be doubted that Moses in part cast the blame of the offense upon Dinah herself when he says she went out to see the daughters of the land whereas she ought to have remained under her mother's eyes in the tent. In other words, what he's saying is her place was at home. Her place should not have been out wandering around without parental permission and without parental protection. Now let me just cover some lessons that we need to learn from Dinah's sin. Look, if you would, at verse 1 again. Notice how apparently innocently this is stated, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. First, we need to be concerned about what we see and hear. The eyes and the ears are direct channels to the soul. When we behold 
or even desire to behold that which is forbidden, we're setting ourselves up as a horrible fall. I want you to turn in your Bibles, whole Genesis 34, but turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. Let me show you a passage, 2 Peter chapter 2. And look if you would please at verses 7 and 8. I've often made this statement. If the Bible had not told me that Lot was a righteous man, I would have said that loss was as lost as a lot, that Lot was as lost as a hound dog. But look what the Bible says. Second Peter two verse seven, talking about God, and delivered just Lot, so he was a just man, vexed, vexed, vexed with the filthy conversation or conduct of the wicked. How did Lot vex himself with the filthy conduct of the wicked? Look at verse 8. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vex his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. You've got to remember that the eyes and the ears are the channels to the soul. Lot vexed his righteous soul in seeing and hearing. Now, I want to tell you something. It is true that TV has become an absolute plague in our homes today most of the time. But if I know in advance that a program is going to be or have involved in it sodomy or adultery, I refuse to watch it. I am not going to watch anything like that. I'm just not going to do it. I, I don't even... If, 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 I, if I see, oh, here's a movie, this sounds good, and I click on the little thing that'll tell me what it's about, and it talks about women having affairs and men having affairs, I'm not watching it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to hear it. And the Bible says, here just Lot dwelt with the wicked and vexed his righteous soul every day. How? In seeing and hearing. There are certain things we ought not to be seeing and we ought not to be hearing. You know what our Lord said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23? Listen to what he said. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil... Thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? What's he saying? We should have an eye that is single. We're not going to be watching and looking and listening to that which is contrary to his word and his truth. We need to learn to pray like David. David in Psalm 119 in verse 37 prayed this. Listen. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken me in the way. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity. Do you realize what the New Testament tells us in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2? We're commanded there to set our affection on things above and not on things of the earth. Colossians 3, 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. After we set our affection on things above, after we refuse to behold vanity, we need the determination that David had in Psalm 101 in verse 3 when David said this. Listen carefully. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. What? Did you hear him? I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate, I hate, he says, the work of them that turn aside. Those who turn aside from God and God's Lord. I hate that. I will not have it. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. 
We have to learn, folks, that we cannot dabble with sin and escape. Our eyes and our ears have to be guarded equally as our tongues are guarded. And as we guard our eyes, our ears, and our tongues, we basically guard our minds. And we need to remember a certain principle of Scripture, and that is this. When God forbids any sin at the same time, He forbids any and every action that would lead up to that sin. So we have to understand, when Dinah went out to see the daughters of the land, it was not just a casual glimpse. Had Dinah not wanted to see the daughters of the land, it never would have happened. Secondly, Dinah did not properly regard or understand the role of her parents. Let me tell you, God did not give parents to hinder their children. God gave parents to help their children. God gave parents to lead, guide, direct, teach, educate, provide, and protect. And I know when you get to be about 18, you think your parents are the dumbest people in the entire world. That all they're trying to do is keep you from having fun. And it's amazing when you hit 30 and 40, you begin to think, you know, my parents weren't so dumb after all. They knew exactly what they were talking about. You see, when Dinah undertook to be her own authority, well, I'll do what I want to do. She sinned. And she got herself into trouble. I want you to understand that Scripture is very explicit on the role of children. And when I say children, I don't care if you're 25 years of age, if you are still home, if you're still under your parents' authority, God still says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment of the promise, that your days may be long upon the earth, which he's given thee. How few children understand these principles, and fewer yet obey them but they disobey them to their own detriment. Now, why did God give parents to children? There are three reasons. God gave parents so that the parents could be, to the children, a prophet, a priest, and a king. As a prophet, we're to declare unto our children the word of God. As a priest, we're to make intercession, pray for our children. As a king, we're to rule over our children. Let me tell you something. When a child disregards the authority of the father and the mother, at the same time, he's disregarding the authority of God. It's God who placed the parents in the role of prophet, priest, and king. It's God who gave the parents. And when a child or children deliberately and maliciously depart from God's standard and God's ordained plan, they bring upon themselves destruction and heartache. That's exactly what happened to Dinah. She disregarded her, past, her, her parents' authority. And she fell into heartache and trouble. You know what should be the hardest thing for a child? Now listen to me. The hardest thing a child should ever face is leaving home and leaving their parents. Grown children who leave home and leave their parents must know that there is a proper biblical way to do that. You try to leave apart from God's orderly way, and you're going to end up 
in trouble. It is good for children to love home and to love their parents. It is the parents' wisdom to make that home lovable and themselves lovable. So the children should rejoice in their duty to their parents and to their home. Now let me just tell you, in one sense of the word, the sin that I'm talking about could be on either party, the children or the parents. If a father refuses to rule his home in love, It is his sin. If the children refuse to submit to a loving and godly father and mother, it is their sin. That's why I said the shoe could be on either foot. Things never go well when the authority of a parent runs low in a family. Scripture admonishes us, let every man bear rule in his own house, And have his children in subjection with all gravity. So what was Dinah's sin? She was curious about that which God had forbidden. And she evidently had no regard for her parents' authority and protection. Thirdly, let me point out that it is a sin as well as a shame When children dishonor their parents. There are many ways to dishonor your parents. Let me give you some examples. And let me go from what I'm going to call from the general to the specific. Look in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 17 and verse 2. Watch this carefully. Proverbs 17 and verse 2. Look what the Bible says. Proverbs 17, verse 2. A wise son, a, a wise servant shall have rule over a son that causeth shame, and shall have part of the inheritance among the brethren. A wise servant shall have rule over a son that causeth shame. In other words, the son is such a disgrace that the parents elevate the servant. Above the sun. Now, interestingly, the word shame here would include any and every form of shame, and any and every form of shame is condemned. The Hebrew word for shamed could also be translated as confounded or disappointed. So he could say, A wise servant shall have rule over a son that causes. Disappointment. One that doesn't amount to anything. Now listen, shame may either be general or specific. Let me show you. Look in Proverbs 19 and verse 26. Proverbs 19, verse 26. Look at this. He that wasteth his father... And chaseth away his mother is a son that causeth shame and bringeth reproach. Now I want you to stop and think about this. Uh, Proverbs 17.2 is very general. Now, Now we're getting a little more specific. He that wasteth his father. What are we talking about? We're talking about spendthrift. We're talking about someone who tears up property who maliciously destroys property. He has no concern for his father, his father's work, his father's savings. Watch. He that wastes his father and chaseth away his mother. In other words, here's a a son that has no respect for his mother. He's not only willing to harm her and hurt her, he's willing to chase her down to do it. You and I could sit here all day and talk about children that are drunkards, dopeheads, gamblers, whoremongers. 
They've destroyed their families. They've wasted their father's earnings. Have no respect for mother. God says, here's a shame. I want to point something out. Do you realize for a child to call shame and dishonor on a family, he doesn't have to be a drunkard or a whoremonger or a dopehead. Look in your Bibles, if you would please, to Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10 and verse 5. Proverbs 10 and verse 5. The Bible says, He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. What's a wise son? Someone that has learned a biblical work ethic. What's a son that causes shame? Someone that's a lazy sluggard. He's worthless. Or as we say in South Georgia, he wouldn't hit a lick at a snake. You know, the Hebrews had a saying, He that does not teach his son the law and a trade teaches him to be a crook and a thief. That's exactly what this word is saying right here. So the son or the child is just a pure sluggard brings this honor and shame upon his family. Look in your Bibles to Proverbs 29 and verse 15. Proverbs 29, verse 15. Now, you know, I told you earlier that the sin could be on the parrot or the child. The shoe could be on either foot. But look in Proverbs 29, verse 15. The Bible says this, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. What's a child left to himself? It's one who's undisciplined, uninstructed, left to his own devices. You want to know how to turn out a sorry child? Just let him do what he wants to do. That's the way to do it. Let him have his way. You can turn one out. But the Bible says the rod and reproof give wisdom. We're talking about family sins. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know if Dinah was raped or seduced. She may have been consenting. Who knows? I'm just simply pointing out the fact that Dinah is responsible for her own sin. If she was seduced, if she gave in, that's her sin. But she would have never been put in that place had Jacob gone where God had told him to go. And she would have never been put in that place had she respected the authority of her parents. And I understand this. The Bible's talking about the rod and reproof given wisdom. I understand that fathers oftentimes are far more willing to correct a son, <laughs> far more ready to correct a son than they are a daughter. And I know that daughters have special places in fathers' hearts. I understand that. The sin could be the child's. Or the sin could be the parents. Family sins work both ways. Was Jacob wrong? Yes. Was Dinah wrong? Yes. Jacob sinned and Dinah sinned. But I want you to understand that Jacob's sin affected Dinah and his family. And you're going to find out next week that Dinah's sin affected her brothers and her family as well. No one lives to himself and no one dies to himself. We have to consider that whatever we do, 
reflects upon our family, affects our family, reflects upon our church, affects our church. It even affects our state and our nation. And I can show you the scripture on that. We do not live to ourselves, nor do we die to ourselves. Now, let me ask you a question. Before I ask it, I want you to turn to Genesis 46. Genesis 46. Just turn there and get ready because I want to show you a verse. I want to ask you a question. Would you like to know what eventually happened to Dinah? Did she marry later on? Did she have children? Was there a happy ending? <laughs> no one knows the answers to those questions. But if you look in Genesis 46 and verse 15, when Jacob goes down into Egypt, verse 15, These be the sons of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob in Padan Aram, with his daughter Dinah. All the souls of his sons and his daughters were thirty and three. Dinah did go in to Egypt with Jacob. Was she married? I don't know. Did she ever marry? I don't know. Did she ever have children? I don't know. Are you listening? I find it interesting and informative that when we live disobedient, disrespectful, and dishonorable lives, Our lives have no meaning and basically are not worth mentioning. This is the last we read of Dinah. She went into Egypt and that's it. What a sad ending. Let me make some applications. It was wrong and wicked for Dinah to go without her parents' permission, and it was certainly wrong and wicked for Dinah to remove herself from under her father's protection. When young men and young women assume and presume that they may do as they please, go where they please, whenever they please, they're dishonoring God and dishonoring and respecting their parents. Period. Children, even grown children, have to learn that God does have an orderly way of leaving home, of marrying, and starting a new home. One does not end up in the right place unless he starts off on the right road. Parents, now listen. If we want our children to be right and do right, it's important that we be right and do right. How can we expect our children to turn out right if we are unwilling to be their instructors and their examples? We cannot take the attitude, do as I say, not do as I do. No. We don't only have to instruct them. We have to lead them and expect them to do as we do. And that's exactly what they're going to do. So if we want them to turn out to be obedient and godly, we must be obedient and godly. The third application is this. If we want our lives to count, we have to learn to be obedient to God and His Word. Otherwise, we like Dinah will drift into obscurity.
You say, my sins are my own. Yes, they are. But what you do affects your family, your brothers, your sisters, your father, your mother, your children, and a multitude of others that you may not even know. For no man liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Let's pray. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ today that you would help us. Speak to our hearts. Teach us. Build us up in the most holy faith. And help us to see, Lord, these two truths. That we are answerable and accountable and responsible for our own sins. But our sins also affect others. Make us holy. Make us obedient. Make us godly. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask and pray. Amen. Amen.